Good morning, church family. It's April 1st when I'm recording this, and winter appears to be in the final throes of giving it to us. It's snowing pretty hard up on Mission Ridge. It just kind of snowed right here while I was starting to give my little introduction to this Sunday. And so uh, she's not done with us yet. I'd like to welcome you to the third version of Living Hope Online. Uh, we'd like to welcome everybody Thank you for joining us this way. We're sorry this is the only way we can get together. And quite frankly, it's really hard on a lot of us that like to be in contact with you. I miss giving hugs. I miss seeing you guys. And I miss being uh, in communion with you. But this is the best we've got. So we're going to make the best of it. And thank you for joining us once again. I'd also like to say a quick thanks to uh, Shane Lamb, Jeremy Payton, Nato Napoles, uh, Hunter, and Jeff who are helping us provide videos as well as Hunter, who is producing all these for us now, so that Jeremy doesn't have so much on his plate. We can't get together anymore because we're a little bit worried about spreading it amongst ourselves. None of us have it, but we just saw that happen at a church over in Skagit County, so we're trying to avoid that. For those of us that uh, were here last week, I want to say congratulations to the Venenbergs. Uh, the Venenberg family came up with the correct answer for trivia for Living Hope. Uh, and they were the three aircraft carriers that survived World War II that were actually in service uh, during Pearl Harbor uh, on December 7, 1941. Those three were the USS Saratoga, the USS Enterprise, and the USS Ranger. That was the tricky one that everyone seemed to have forgotten about. This week for our trivia, uh, we're going to stick with World War II again, and one of my favorite things, airplanes. So, during World War II, almost 4,000 B-29 Super Fortress airplanes were made. Um, fantastic aircraft. Obviously, it conducted the bombing raids on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. How many, this uh, trivia question is, how many are still in flyable conditions, and what is their names? How many of the B-29, of the 4,000 that were produced, are still in flying condition, and what were their names? All right, guys, you can just post those answers below here anywhere. We'll follow it up. Have a great time. Please enjoy the time that you've been given. Um, I know that a lot of us are getting house cooped. A lot of us feel housebound. A lot of us feel challenged by this. But I was looking over my notes um, from some of the meetings that we had in our small group from men's retreats. And one of the biggest things that keeps coming up is, I wish I had more time with my family. I wish I had more time to do things with them. I wish I had more time to focus on the things that I feel are important besides making a living or besides running around. God just kind of gave us that opportunity. So make the most of it. Enjoy it while you've got it. May not be ideal conditions, but what you choose to make of it is up to you. And you have an opportunity to spend that time. All right, my friends, we love you. We miss you. Thank you for joining us online today. Please be safe. Please be healthy. And above all, remember Jesus loves you. Hey guys, stuck here in quarantine, getting a little bored. Was wondering, what are all the kids doing while they're stuck in quarantine? We would love to see that as a church. So kids, whatever you're up to, whatever creative things you're doing, like dancing, playing games, just singing, crafting, whatever it might be, we would love to see it. So each week as a church, we're going to try to play a few of those. So send us your videos and we'll get those going. Thanks. Bye. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Hi. Planes Phase 10. Hi. Planes in Phase 10. <laughs> Hi. Wait, who is that for? Hi. <laughs> it's time you know the power of the dark side of the force. No, Dad. Why? I am your father. Hey, Teen Time Kids. Just wanted to reach out to you guys and let you know that Paul and I have been missing hanging out with you on Sunday mornings. We look forward to the time that we can all get back together and talk about how things have gone through this time. Uh, hopefully everything is going well. And before I leave, I just wanted to leave you with a couple memory verses. It's from Philippians 4, 6 through 7. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with 
thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I just love that. It tells us not to be anxious, not to worry, that we can come to God with everything that we have in our lives and come to him in prayer. And I love the word petition. To me, that's a word that says togetherness. It means let's pray together. And on top of that, we can just be thankful for everything in our lives right now that we do have. We have friends, we have family, we have food on the table and a country with freedom that we can trust in to help us get through this time. And finally, I think just the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I just love that. The idea that we can't understand it all, but we can pray with God and to God and just know that his peace will cover our hearts and minds. Take care and we look forward to seeing you soon. Hi, Living Hope family. This is Brock and Allison and we just wanted to deliver a message to you all from the board and the deaconesses. Yeah, we just wanna tell you that uh, the board and the deaconesses are going to uh, be contacting every member of the church uh, if they haven't already the last few days. And uh, we are trying to get video conferencing set up uh, so that we can talk in small groups. So especially with Easter approaching, we want to continue our relationships. So you will hear from one of us soon. So God speaks to Jonah and he says, get up. I want you to go out to this town, Nineveh, this great city, and preach against it because basically they're so rotten I can't take it anymore. And Jonah, however, decides he's going to flee the opposite direction to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Okay, pause for just a second. If there's one thing we can say about Jonah, it's this guy... He really goes out of his way. And by he goes out of his way, let me show you this map. This is the um, proposed journey to Tarshish versus Nineveh. So uh, his hometown, Gath Hefer, is near the S in this map in Israel. So that's where he would have started. And you can see how over here up on the top right, that's northwest of where he started. His hometown is Nineveh. And then all the way over there to the left in modern day Spain, that's where he was setting out to go. So that trip to Tarshish where he was trying to go would be about 2,500 miles compared to the 500 mile trip that God was asking him to go on. So he definitely went out of his way. Back to the story. Then the Lord hurled a violent wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. The sailors were afraid and each cried out to his God. They threw the ship's cargo in the sea to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the vessel and stretched out and fallen into a deep sleep. Right. The captain approached him and said, what are you doing? Sound asleep. Get up. Call to your God. Maybe, maybe this God will consider us and we won't perish. Come on, the sailors said to each other, let's cast lots. Then we'll know who's to blame for this trouble we're in. So they cast lots, and the lot singled out Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us who's to blame for this. Tell us who's to blame for this trouble we're in. What's your business, and where are you from? What's your country, and what people are you from? He answered, well, I'm a Hebrew. I worship Yahweh, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, what is this that you've done? The men knew he was fleeing from the Lord's pleasance because he told them. So they said to him, okay, so what should we do to you to calm this sea that's against us? For the sea was getting worse and worse. He answered them, well, pick me up and throw me into the sea so it may quiet down for you, for I know I'm to blame for this violent storm that's against you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they couldn't because the sea was raging around them more and more. So they called out to the Lord, please Yahweh, don't let us perish because of this man's life and don't charge us with his innocent blood for you Yahweh have done just as you pleased. Then they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea and the sea stopped its raging. 
The men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Wow, so I mean, we don't have a lot of stories quite like this where the prophet is just pretty super disappointing. Um, you know, it kind of reminds you of the quote by Catherine Erdberg. She says, uh, if you can't be a good example, then you'll just have to be a horrible warning. You know, you, you normally when you think of prophets, these are amazing examples of godly people. Not in this case. However, 750 years approximately after this story took place, a repeat of it happened in a different way. I want to make a proposal to you, and this is it that Jesus himself relived this scene from the Jonah story to reveal his identity and purpose to stubborn, unbelieving people. That story is found in three of the Gospels. We're going to look at the one that is in Mark 4, 35 to 41, if you want to turn there. Um, and we'll show the scriptures on the screen now, too. Here's this story. On that same day, when evening had come, he told them, he being Jesus, let's cross over the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him along, since he was already in the boat, and other boats were with him. A fierce windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. So they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence! Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he said to him, Why are you fearful? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked one another, Who, who then is this? Even the wind and sea obey him. Okay, so we're going to look at these two stories side by side as best we can because there are tons of parallels and the more I dug into it, the deeper it got. So first thing we look at is these are both men chosen by God who are to take a message of peace of God where he wants people to repent and he plans to restore them, right? That's why Jonah didn't go because he had an inkling and he tells us later, I thought you were going to do this, right? And this was the message Jesus came. He came to seek and save the lost, right? Okay, both of them hired a boat. Both of them shortly thereafter got into this violent windstorm. Both of them, the storm was so severe that it threatened to sink or destroy the ship. And both of them, it mentions that God's messenger is sleeping at the bottom of the boat in the midst of all the turmoil. And it also mentions that everybody else in the boat is having a fit. They're, they're, they're freaking out. They're fighting for their lives on this boat. And so in the middle of that, they get this indignant wake-up call. What are you doing? We're all about to die, and you're down here taking a nap. Okay, this is where the stories split apart a little bit, because we know in Jonah's story, it mentions that God sends the storm, and then Jonah says, the storm's my fault. We don't have that same thing going on in the gospel story, in Jesus' story, his storm. So he's not, he's not at fault here. So... And then, of course, we have Jonah, who calms the sea by being thrown into it. Big difference to Jesus, who calms the sea by speaking to it with authority. That's a totally different thing. Okay, both of them, back to parallels between the two, the onlookers are gripped with fear and amazement. Okay, in Jesus' story, in, in Luke 8.25, it says, they were fearful and amazed, asking one another, who can this be? He commands even the winds and the waves, and they obey him. So this is later. These are the people that have been hanging out with Jesus for a long time. They've been watching him do miracles, and they're like, whoa, who is this guy? Go back to Jonah 1.9. When they asked Jonah, who do you serve? He answers them, I'm a Hebrew. I worship Yahweh the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. Isn't that amazing? So way back in the book of Jonah, they are answering the question that Jesus' own disciples are asking him. Who is this guy that, that the seas obey him? And Jonah back there said, this is my God. This is the one. And Jesus is 
definitely, definitely drawing the direct line between Yahweh and himself and his ability to direct the wind and the waves. Here's another parallel I want you to see, a, a difference between the two. First is that when we see Jonah, Jonah would rather die than see his enemies saved. Jonah 4.3. He says, and now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. On the other side of that, we have our Jesus, who Philippians 2.8 tells us that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. So they treat life very differently, where Jonah's willing to throw his away and Jesus is willing to offer his in order to save others. Jonah also would rather die than see his enemies saved. In 4.9, then God asked Jonah, after he's saved Nineveh and seen this revival happen, he says, is it right for you to be angry about a plant, this plant that God caused to grow and then die? And Jonah says, yes, it's right. I'm angry enough to die. So he's just mad about this whole thing. Whereas we see our Jesus in Romans 5.8 where he dies to save his enemies. But God proves his own love for us, and that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And in the response at seeing God's mercy from Jonah, it, it looks like this in 4, 1 to 2, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was in my, still in my own country? This is why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you're a merciful and compassionate God, slow to become angry, rich in faithful love, and one who relents from sin and disaster. Ugh, how annoying. On the other hand, you've got Jesus, who instead of being appalled at God's mercy, he appeals to God's mercy, even while he himself is being literally tortured to death. In the middle of that part, he sees the potential for God to pour out his wrath. And so he prays this to his father. In Luke 23, 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. Wow. And then we have this other parallel where, where both stories, um, the prophets are down below sleeping. And Jesus gets up, and he's like, you know what, we're not gonna die. I'm just gonna command this storm to subside, and it will, it'll obey me, because that's what you can do when you're God. And then later on, when we see him in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he is truly about to die, and he knows it, he's told them they haven't quite understood it well, that he knows he's going to die. Um, he is not loving this idea at all. Um, so he knows that his life is coming to an end at this point. And the role reversal that happens here is when he goes to find his disciples, they're the ones who are sleeping at this point. And Luke 22, 45 says, when he got up from prayer and came to the disciples, he found them sleeping, exhausted from their grief. Why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. Doesn't that sound a lot like Jonah's story? where he's just like, wait, why are you guys sleeping? You need to get up and pray to your God right now. We are in serious trouble. And here's Jesus doing the same thing to his, his disciples who are sleeping. Man, here's the overwhelming thing I get from this, the contrast between, between Jonah and Jesus, these two men of God, one who is God incarnate, This is the God who instead of turning away from you, who instead of rejecting you, this is the God who runs towards you. I want to show you something that I, that I discovered in, in looking through this. So I want to show you this map. This is a map that shows Jesus' journey from Nazareth to Capernaum. Up in Capernaum, that's where we believe that Jesus caught the boat and cross the Sea of Galilee, which is the story that we read earlier. So now let's look at this map of Jonah 
starting off in his hometown of Gath Hefer, and he's called to Nineveh. Nineveh is northeast of him, so of course he heads to Joppa, which is directly southwest from him, right? So here's the thing that I noticed in this, is that if Jonah would have obeyed, and if he'd have traveled by land, he may have gone by way and wound up on that same path that Jesus took by Capernaum, perhaps even crossing the Sea of Galilee, the same waters that Jesus crossed in his story, had he obeyed the first time. And then I thought, started looking, okay, is this true? Where, where is Gathafar in, in relation to Nazareth, where Jesus' journey started? So I had to find actually some, some map coordinates because that town no longer exists. And it turns out that that town of Gath Hefar is less than five miles away, according to Google, from central Nazareth. I mean, five miles away, that's not even crossing the town of, of Wenatchee, right? I mean, you're barely getting from one edge of town to the other. So while those would have been different towns and, and things are different when you're walking, but still, that's just not a very far distance. So it could easily be considered, people could consider that the same region, at least. And when you consider the town he's going to, Nineveh, it mentions that Nineveh is such a big city that it takes three days to cross it. So the fact that this is, you know, a two hour walk from central Nineveh to Gath Hefar, we're looking at them starting off, even though they're hundreds of years apart, starting their journeys in a very similar location. And that just kind of blew me away that this idea that Jesus is doing all the things that Jonah failed to do. And what he's doing more than anything is coming straight at people like you and I, people who find ourselves in rebellion, people who are dragging our feet, people whose hearts are hard. So this is Palm Sunday, and another contrast that didn't, didn't escape me in this one is Palm Sunday, this is, this is Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And then you've got the irony around this that we know what's gonna happen on Good Friday, right? So here's Jesus willing to go to this town that does not have its heart set on him. And in fact, these are the same people who are going to kill him in a few days. And he is going to set off for this town knowing that it's literally going to cost him his life. And he chooses to enter in any way. He knows that the same people who are lauding him, praising him, are in a few days going to be the same ones cursing him, spitting on him, beating him, and crucifying him and yet he goes anyway so he's working always to restore us to come toward us those of us who have soft hearts and open hearts toward him he's also working to restore us when we have hard unforgiving hearts He's using us to bring about his good plans and we're fully passionate followers and he's using us, like in Jonah's case, to fulfill his good plans even when we're half-hearted. Isn't that amazing? I mean, talk about Hosanna, this God who comes to save us. That was Hosanna's what they were shouting at Jesus when he was entering Jerusalem, the God who saves and here he is picking up, correcting all the things that this one prophet did wrong and being the prophet, being the God who comes straight at us and meets us where we're at. What a marvel of grace. God, break us again and soften us to your presence and to your working. I just pray that, that as we look at Palm Sunday, as we look toward Resurrection Sunday next week, that God will till the soil of our hearts, pull out all the rocks and let his love multiply and grow in us. So I want to look back at storms. There are uh, a few ways we deal with them and we're in both these cases storms can just be happening around you or it can be because of something you did, right? We have two different storms going on here. Um, they happen. 
storms are a part of life and I just want to talk about a few just to prep you for your discussions with your groups in just a few minutes here. I want to talk about a few different ways that we respond to storms. The first is we can take the sailor approach, which is like the sailors in our stories where we're just going to row. When things get tough, we just row and we row hard. I'm going to rely on my strengths. I'm going to stick to what I know. I'm going to pray to my gods, which might be my finances, my intellect, uh, the medical services I have available, the government I live in, uh, that I live under, um, the relationships I have, maybe my reputation. I'm going to require these things and, and maybe uh, in an effort to appease uh, my God, I'm going to throw off things. Maybe I've got habits that I want to get rid of and, and I want this God to, to approve of me at this point and to help me. So I'm going to try to offload things that are heavy and, and then maybe God will be appeased. So that's the sailor approach. The second approach that you might have is the sleeper approach where you just kind of go below deck and pretend nothing's happening. Uh, I mean, if God's going to take you out, might as well be well rested, right? Um, yeah, and, and, and in this case, uh, I, I relate more closely to this one. Distraction is great. You know, if you're going to take the sleeper approach, distraction is fantastic, especially if you don't, if you don't feel like being challenged right at this moment. Um, and maybe like Joan, I, I, I can talk about God and refer to him and associate with him, but I'm not really talking to God. That would be different because I, I might um, hear something that I don't want to hear. And the problem with hearing from God is then you're responsible to whatever that is. And then you're stuck in this spot. OK, now I'm going to obey or not obey. So it's just easier to be distracted and take a sleeper approach. Third approach that we see in this is the scion. And I know what you're thinking, scion. I'm not talking about the, the cart, right? They are named, okay, I actually didn't know this, but the word scion, there are two definitions. The first is a young shoot or a twig of a plant, especially one for cutting or grafting or rooting, or it can mean the descendant of a notable family. Wow, isn't that awesome? Both of those definitions are right on the nose for those of us who are in Christ. We are grafted and we are a shoot from him. We are from a notable family and, and grafted into his line. I love that. Whereas the scion approach to this would be someone who turns toward God instead of away. And we might seek his presence. We might even seek his presence above our comfort or regardless of, of whether our our needs get met or our, or our comfort is is increased we would a scion would anchor yourself in the character of god and and use and his use of the difficulties in your life to bring about the purposes that he's after and a scion will stand in his will and his authority addressing storms directly Okay, he may not calm the waves around you, but he can calm the storm inside you, bringing peace that passes understanding. So what I want you to do is when you get into your groups, here's your question. When things get tough, when the storms come, do you tend toward the sailor, the sleeper, or the scion? And I know we'll relate to different ones here and there, but just a way to get into what does it look like for you? Let people know what that, what that looks like when you do that. Okay. Second part, once you discuss that, remember in both of these stories, uh, a key thing was that the sailors were in awe when they saw God calm the storm. I want you to think of a story. It doesn't have to be yours, but it's awesome if it is. Tell a story of a time when God miraculously calmed the storms either around you, within you, or both. All right, let's pray. God, thank you for being our God who pursues us. Thank you for this, the obedience that you had. Thank you for going towards us in our disobedience and our flat out rebellion. And we're grateful that you have come to us today to greet us with your grace and to fill us with yourself. God, would you just fill our times and our groups? Would you just meet us, Holy Spirit? 
as we seek to learn more about you and learn to love each other and learn about you from each other. Reveal all this by the power of your spirit and for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a fantastic day. Yeah.